Acts 14 is where we are this morning, and I've got a word for you that uh, is going to be a blessing to you. We're going to look at a lot of scripture today, so I hope, I hope you have your Bibles. I, I have most of them on the screen, but it's always helpful as we open God's word in, in our hands and we can see it and read it for ourselves. And we're going to pick up this week right where we left off last week. We finished and concluded Acts chapter 13 last week looking at this missionary journey that Paul and Barnabas were on. And we're going to pick up the story right back in Acts chapter 14. But before we we jump into reading through the passage, I I just want to lay a foundation and I want to remind you of some things of where we are in the book of Acts and also the bigger story about what the Bible teaches us. Because as we, as we get into the book of Acts today, it's not just about what happened back then. It's about how God wants his people to live right now. And, and we need to look at where, what we can learn from this passage about today, about 2020. And it does have a lot to say about that. And so the Bible, what it declares to us from the beginning is that God is the creator of the world. That God is the creator of everyone and everything. We see that at the, on the very first pages of the Bible, that, that existence didn't just spring from nowhere. It came from God. He spoke, and the universe came into being. That existence began in obedience to the, the decree and the declaration of the Word of God. And as we read that creation story, it tells us that God created the heavens and the earth, that God created the mountains and the seas, that God created the the birds and the animals. And then it it pauses the creation account, and it pauses to tell us about God creating humanity. And what it shows us is that humanity is not like the heavens and the earth, that humanity is not like the birds and the animals and the sea and the mountains, that humanity is special. Humanity is distinct from the rest of creation. That we did not spring forth from the creation. That God created us specifically in his image to bear his likeness. And so what this means is that every human life has dignity. Every human life is valuable. Every human life matters to God. God has declared that we are created in his image. What this means is that we are to show forth the glory of God. Just as a a mirror reflects light, you and I, each one of us, we were designed to reflect the nature, the character, the majesty, the splendor, the awe, the wonder of the creator God. This is why God created us. This is our purpose. And God, after he finished creation, he declared that it was very good. Very good. But as we look at our world today, we don't see a world that is very good. We actually see a world that is very bad. The Bible tells us why that is. It's because humanity, as the image bearers of God, that we chose not to live for God, not to live for God's glory, We chose not to live under God's law, but to go our own way, to follow our own path, to to seek our own glory, to to not live under God's law, but to be a law in and unto ourselves. The the way this came about was Satan came and and he told a lie to our first parents, Adam and Eve, and, and they believed that lie. They acted on that lie. And when that happened, it did not bring a blessing into the world, but it brought a curse. And so the world today lives under the curse of sin and death. And with this curse came everything wrong with our world. When they brought sin into the world, disease and sickness and illness came into the world. Brokenness came into the world. Animosity and, 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 and fighting and, and struggling in relationships and between groups of people and and nations. And and all of these things came into the world when humanity chose not to, to believe the truth, but rather to believe the lie. That all of the world today lives under the curse of sin and death. That when they sinned, death came into the world. 
And what God made very good, we, by going our own way, have made very bad. But the Bible also tells us that God loves the world. That God loves his creation. That God loves his image bearers. And so at the right time, at the fullness of time, according to his perfect plan, he sent his son Jesus into the world. The world that was good but now was bad. Jesus came from heaven to earth to declare the word of God. To, to shine the light back into the darkness. We know that Jesus, as the Son of God, he lived a life without sin, never once committing a sin, never once telling a lie, never once cheating, never once looking with a, a, a impurity upon another, that Jesus lived the perfect life. And Jesus then came to... The whole reason he came was to redeem what was lost, to seek and to save what was lost, to redeem humanity. And so Jesus goes to the cross, and on the cross, Jesus pays the price for sin. Jesus atones for sin. You see, the problem in our world, it is sin. That is the problem. Every problem springs from sin, the sinfulness of human hearts. But Jesus came, and he paid the price for sin. He dealt with sin on the cross. On the cross, he declared that it is finished, the work was accomplished. And on the third day, Jesus rose from the grave because death could not hold him down. And he rose in victory. He rose conquering sin, conquering Satan, conquering the curse, so that all who would believe upon him could have this everlasting life, could be delivered out of darkness and into light, could not, would not have to live under the curse but now live again under the blessing of God. And so we who are in Christ today, we are united with him in his victory, united with him in his life as we have believed upon him. God's plan for you is that you would be set free from the power of sin, that you would be set free from the forces of evil and the forces of darkness, and that you would live a life of freedom to love God and to serve others as we follow Christ. Well, Jesus, he commissioned, after he, he did his work of, of salvation, he commissioned his followers to go into the world and to declare this gospel, to declare this message, so that all who would believe in him would not perish but have life eternal. And what we've seen through the book of Acts is that his followers, his disciples, his apostles... What are they doing? They're doing just that. They're leaving their places of comfort. They're leaving their homes. And they're stepping out into darkness with the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so last week we saw as Paul and Barnabas were on this missionary journey, they went to a city called Antioch. They went into a synagogue. They preached the gospel. A week later, the whole town showed up to hear what they had to say. People were filled with jealousy that people were listening to, to Paul and Barnabas and the leaders started a riot and had Paul and Barnabas ran out of town. And the story tells to us that when they left Antioch, they went into Iconium. And that's where we pick up the story again today in Acts chapter 14. That was my introduction for you this morning. Just so we're all on the same page, all right? So Acts 14, verse 1, Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with the rulers to mistreat the apostles and to stone them, this was a, a plot to murder the apostles, when they learned of it, they fled 
to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, in our time together, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. What a joy it is to be able to gather today. Lord, with so much confusion and chaos in our world, in the midst of it all, there is a sure place for us to stand, and it is on your word, which is the truth. Lord, stir us to be people of the truth. Stir us to be people of your word. Stir us again. Call us back again to be people of the book, to be people of the word. Lord, that in this day and age with so much confusion that we would know the truth and that we would walk in freedom, the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, if you were here last week or listened to the, the live stream last week, you might say, is, is, is this not the same story from last week? Paul and Barnabas, they go into a town, they preach in a synagogue, lots of people believe, people get upset, they start a riot, and they run Paul and Barnabas out of town. Isn't this the same story? Well, yes and no. It is the same story in that it's the same events unfolding that happened last week in Acts chapter 13. But it's not the same story in that it's a different town, it's a different place, it's different people. But what we've seen time and time again is that through the book of Acts, the same stories end up repeating themselves as the gospel advances that darkness arises and opposes the advancement of the gospel, that there is opposition. And what this tells us is that Though we may not be missionaries like Paul and Barnabas, we don't live in a foreign country taking the gospel to people who have never heard before, but what this shows us is that as we remain faithful to God in our lives, that the same spiritual forces of darkness that oppose Paul and Barnabas, that oppose the gospel, that oppose the light, that those same spiritual forces will be at work and are at work in our lives in 2020 in San Antonio. We need to be aware of this. You need to know this, that, that there is a battle raging, that there is a war happening in our world. This is not a war that is new. This, this, what we're seeing in our world today, it didn't start in 2020. It didn't start 50 years ago when they kicked God out of schools and prayer out of schools. It didn't start 2,000 years ago. No, this war started in the garden. In fact, actually, it started in heaven as Satan rebelled against God and chose to go his own way. And then that war came from heaven to earth as people chose to follow Satan and not follow God. And this war between truth and lies, between light and darkness, between good and evil, it has been raging ever since the beginning of the world. In this battle, we're in the same fight. We are a part of this. And if you don't realize this, it will cost you. If you don't get in the fight, if you don't start fighting the spiritual forces of darkness, there will be casualties in your life, in your relationships, in your family. So what we're going to talk about today is called spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare. What we're going to see is how Paul and Barnabas fight. This is what they're involved in. So from them, we're going to learn how to fight and how we can get in the fight as well because it's time for all of us to get in the fight. The fight that we're talking about is not the fight between a donkey and an elephant, or between red and blue. It's not the fight between Democrat and Republican. This is a fight between truth and lies, between light and darkness. We need to understand that the fights that happen in those other arenas are just a manifestation of a greater war that is raging. And we as believers, we need to 
We need to have a discerning eye. The, we have for us God's revelation that explains to us how and why and the way all of these things happen. And we, we need to know the truth and, and to, to understand and not be swept away with the chaos of our world. Amen. So let's jump back into Acts 14. It says, In Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. That's awesome. Right? We're not talking about a handful of people that believed. We're not talking about three or four. He says a great number of people are converted to Christ. That means they, they believed upon Jesus, that they were born again by the Spirit of God, that they had their sins forgiven, that they were being obedient to the teaching of Christ, and they were seeing the sanctifying work of the Spirit in their lives. This is awesome. And it's many, many, many people that are being converted in this town. This is now the ninth or the tenth time in the book of Acts that it tells us that many people, wholesale families and communities have turned to the Lord. This is God at work. This isn't because Paul is such a great preacher and Barnabas is such a great teacher. This is the work of God. This is the work of the Holy Spirit producing this fruit through Paul and Barnabas. But not everybody is happy about this. It says in verse 2, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brothers. That between those who believe and those who do not believe, there's conflict, there's battle, there, there's, there's war, there, there's animosity, there's, there's uh, strife between those who believe and those who don't believe. And the picture that the Bible paints for us of our world is that there are two types of people. There are those who believe in Jesus Christ and those who do not believe. The world is broken into two categories. Those who are part of God's family. This, Jesus, this is straight from the teaching of Jesus, John chapter 8. Those who belong to God's family and those who belong to the family of the devil. There's a group of people in John chapter 8 that claim to be part of God's family, and Jesus says, actually, guys, I hate to break it to you, but you're part of the devil's family because you don't believe in the Son of God. You see, our world is not broken into two groups of people, the, the, those who are oppressed and those who are being oppressed. That is not what the Word of God teaches. What the Word of God teaches is that the world is broken into two people, those who believe and those who do not. Amen. Those who have had their sins forgiven and have been washed clean and are, and are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and those who live under the power of the devil. Jesus says those who practice sin are a slave to sin, that those that are part of the family of the devil are in bondage. And that there is a war, that there is a conflict, that there is strife, that there is a battle that ends up taking place. And how is it that those who do not believe, how is it that those who reject Christ, how do they wage this warfare? What is it that they fight with? What shape and form does this opposition take? Well, it tells us that they poisoned the minds of the people. Now, how did they do this? Did they inject them with some kind of drug that, you know, made them hallucinate? Well, what does it mean that they poisoned their mind? Well, Paul and Barnabas, we know they're preaching what? What are they preaching? The truth. They're preaching the truth of the word of God. They're preaching the truth of the gospel. They're preaching Jesus Christ, whom he himself declared himself to be the truth. And so to oppose the truth... And to poison people's minds, what is it that they're teaching? Lies, deceit, deception, things that are not true. And so they begin to undermine the truth of God with lies. They begin to undercut the truth of the gospel with falsehood and with deceit. And it says that people begin to believe the lies, and when they do, 
it poisons their mind. That means they can't think clearly. They can't properly interpret the situation that's in front of them. And they, they begin to even plot to destroy those that have brought them the truth because their minds have been poisoned. And this is what the Bible teaches to us is spiritual warfare. This that's happening right here in Acts 14, this is spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is not some sort of like, you know, spooky, hocus pocus, Harry Potter kind of stuff. It's not setting up a bunch of candles and that's not spiritual warfare. This truth and lies is spiritual warfare. Light and darkness is spiritual warfare. The battle between truth and lies is spiritual. Did you know your thoughts and your thought life is spiritual? Your thoughts and your thought life is spiritual. Are your thoughts, your thought life, your imagination, is that part of the natural world? Is that physical? Can you see your thoughts? Can you handle your thoughts? Can you taste your thoughts? Your thoughts, the imaginations of your heart, they're not part of the physical world, but they're real. They exist, and they are spiritual. Spiritual warfare is the truth versus the false, the true gospel versus the false gospel, false ideas and philosophies and ideologies and worldviews. This is what is spiritual warfare. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, the Apostle Paul talks about this. He says, though we live in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. You see, all of us live in a physical body. We, we occupy a physical space. We, we live in the physical world. We all look different. We all talk a little different. We all have a different sound to our voice. We live in a physical body, but you are more than the body that sits in that chair right there. There's more to you than your physical body. You are body, soul, and spirit. There is an immaterial part to you. This, of course, is what people who are completely dominated by a false idea of naturalism, they deny this fact. They deny that there's any sort of spiritual world or, or world that exists beyond the natural. We, of course, who understand the word of God, understand completely that God is spirit and that there is good and evil and forces of spiritual light and darkness. And though we live in this physical world, we don't wage war according to the flesh. It's not a physical bodily conflict that we are in. The weapons, he says, that we fight with are not of the flesh. They're not natural. They're not material. We don't fight this battle. We don't fight spiritual battles with a sword, a physical sword. This weapon is, this war is not fought with guns and with bombs and with grenades. Not natural weapons. The weapons we fight with, he says, they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments, he says. And every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And take every thought captive to obey God. Christ. So what is spiritual warfare? What, what is it that he, we, we are fighting with and, and what is it that we are fighting against? Paul says that with the weapons that have divine power, we destroy strongholds. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is a fortified place. You think of a fortified city, a city that is has a wall built around it. It is a hard place to penetrate. It is a place where you can attack from. It is a place of domination. That is a stronghold. And then he goes on to list in verse 
five, the strongholds that our weapons destroy. What are these strongholds that we destroy? Arguments. False thoughts. Lofty opinions that raise themselves against the knowledge of God and thoughts that do not want to obey Jesus Christ. This word argument in the Greek, it's the word logismos, which means reasoning, imagination, thoughts. The root word, of course, is the word logos, the word that there is the true word, Jesus Christ, the word become flesh, and then there is false ideas, false words, false ideologies, false ways that people claim of salvation even. And spiritual warfare is combating the lies of Satan with the truth of God. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 6, a, a passage that may be familiar to you. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, he says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Again, the, the conflict is not physical. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The spiritual warfare, the battle that takes place is a warfare against false ideologies, a battle against lies, a battle against deception, a battle against worldviews that would write, that, that, are, that, are, that try to ignore God. Worldviews that oppose, they, 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 they lift themselves up against the knowledge of God. This is spiritual warfare. The Bible tells us clearly that there is a spirit at work in the world that is opposed to Christ, opposed to the Logos, opposed to the, the true, op opposed to Jesus. And it calls this spirit the Antichrist spirit. This spirit is at work in our world today. It opposes Christ and Everywhere that you read Jesus and Christ, you can also insert the truth. The truth. So there is anti-truth spirits at work in the world today. There are spirits that are d dark and demonic and oppose the truth of God in the hearts of mankind. And it poisons people's souls. And if you are not careful... This is why it really matters. If you are not careful, you too will find yourself bound by lies with an enemy setting up a stronghold in your life. You see, you can be a believer in Christ and have a stronghold. Have the enemy have a stronghold in your life. You can believe in Jesus for salvation and have been born again by the Spirit of God, but still have a place in your life where you believe a lie. And from that place, the enemy can wreak havoc in your life. It is like a fortified city in your life, and he can attack you from that position of power. He can attack you through your own thoughts. He can attack you in a million different ways, seeking to destroy your marriage, seeking to destroy your relationships, seeking to destroy your family and your parenting and your children, seeking to destroy your relationships within the body of Christ through lies and deceit. He wants to bind you in lies and to destroy you. So what do we do? How do we fight? How do we engage in this battle? Well, what did Paul and Barnabas do? How did they fight? How did they engage in the battle? It tells us in verse 3. So, after they were poisoning people's minds with lies and deceit and falsehood, so 
they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord. What did they do? Oh, they're spreading lies. They're poisoning people's minds. Oh, oh well. No, it says that the more that the, the darkness tried to exert itself, the more boldly they got in shining the light. The, the, the louder the lies got, the louder they got with the truth. They did not retreat. They dug in their heels and they said, we will declare the word of God. We will continue to preach and to proclaim the gospel, the truth, the word. Ephesians chapter 6, which we read about spiritual warfare, verse 17. It says that we must, as God's people, take up the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. What is the weapon that we fight with? What is it that we do battle with? How do we engage the enemy? How do we get involved in this battle? With the word of God, with the sword of the spirit. We only have one weapon, and it is the truth. It is the word. It is God's revelation. This is what we fight with. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The word of God is a sword, a sword. And what is the purpose of a sword? The main function of a sword? It is to divide. It is to cut. It is to separate. And it separates the truth of the word of God. What it separates is truth from lies. It separates light from darkness. From reality from error. That there really is an objective and absolute truth. We live in a world that says... There's not truth. That what's true for you is not true for me. Guess what that is? That is a lie. That there is an objective, an absolute truth. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And this truth, this sword, it brings division. It separates things. We look at what happens in Iconium, the city where they're at. In verse 4, it says, the people of the city were divided. That when the lies came in and the truth went forth, that what came was a separation between truth and lies. That there, there, are, there are those who rejected the truth and those who received the truth. There are those who did not want to obey Christ and submit to Christ and to live under God's rule and reign. They instead wanted to live under their own our thoughts, their own ideologies, their own worldview. And so what does the word of God do? It brings a division between those that believe and those that do not. And this should not be a surprise to us. This should not be a surprise to us. This is what Jesus said. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. These are the words of our Lord. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. There's this false idea about Jesus Christ. That he was just this long-haired, pot-smoking hippie that walked around in a linen dress, going out through the countryside, pe preaching peace and love, driving around in his VW van tie-dye t-shirt that's not jesus christ that's some false idea of jesus that the enemy has spread to bring lies and strongholds into people's lives jesus says i didn't come to bring peace i came to bring a sword and this is what this sword will do he says i have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy 
of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What is the sword that Jesus brought? Of course, it's the truth of the word of God. And the truth divides. The truth divides. We need to understand this. There are those in our world today, even well-meaning Christians, who th say things like, we shouldn't fight and argue about things like doctrine and theology. If we do that, it just brings division. We, can't we just be united? Can't we all just be together? Can't we all just get around a campfire and sing kumbaya? We can, if we believe the truth. But if there are lies and deceit and error, according to the word of God, that are leading people astray and into bondage and into strongholds, the most loving thing that we can do is to confront that with the word of God. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 4, he talks about that we must strive for unity in the body of Christ. That we must strive to maintain unity in the bond of peace. And then he goes on to outline what we must be united on. And he outlines for us true doctrine, true theology. It's doctrine and theology, the truth that we are united on. We can't aim for some false unity with people that believe lies. That won't produce anything in our lives. Jesus says he came to bring a sword. So we need to understand that, number one, the word of God divides. The word of God brings division. Secondly, I want to share with you today that the word of God also brings freedom. The word of God brings freedom. The word of God as a sword, it cuts you free from the chains of bondage, from the shackles of sin, from the shackles of defeat, from everything false that would try to lead you astray and produce death in your life. God's word will sever that from your life and lead you into freedom, into freedom. We know this passage from John 8, verse 32. Jesus says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth brings freedom. The truth sets us free from the lies of the enemy. But Jesus says that to have this truth set us free, that we must know it. You see, it's not just truth that sets us free, it's the truth that we know that sets us free. If I'm walking in ignorance of the truth and I don't know the truth, I will not walk in freedom. If I know the truth and have rejected the truth, I will not walk in freedom. If I have an intellectual understanding of the truth, but I have not embraced the truth as reality, I will not walk in freedom. You see, this word no is not just cognitive understanding. This word no is an intimate embrace. Where you say, I have made this truth a part of me. This is, this is mine. That truth will set you free. That truth will lead you out of bondage and into the light. Well, how do we know this truth? Well, if we go back one verse from John 8, 32 to John 8, 31, Jesus said to those who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The only way to know the truth is to abide in the word. That's the only way. The truth is only found in one place. It's right here. It's the word of God. Are you living in the word? 
Are you embracing the word? Are you studying the word? God's word, God's truth? Or are you filling your heart and your soul with so many other words, with so many other thoughts, with so many other ideas and ideologies? If we are not careful, the enemy can use those to set up strongholds in our lives. But the only way for us to walk in freedom, the only way to have the the word of God sever lives from our lives is we must know it and we must abide in it. Jesus talked in John chapter 15 that we are to abide in him, that he is the true vine, he is the true source of life, that we are to live in Christ, to live in his word. But too often today in 2020, I, I'm, I, I had this horrible fear and, and suspicion that so many Christians are not abiding in the word of God. So many of us, uh, brothers and sisters, we are abiding in other words. To know the truth and to walk in freedom, we must abide in God's word. The third thing I want to share with you about God's word is that God's word sanctifies. God's word sanctifies. John chapter 17, this is what Jesus said as he prayed, as he was on his way to the cross. John chapter 17 and verse 14. Here Jesus is praying for his disciples and he's also praying for those who would believe in him. And if you have believed in Jesus, what this means is that this prayer that Jesus prayed, he prayed for you. Jesus says, I have given them your word, praying to the Father, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Listen, if you've believed in Christ, you're not of the world anymore. You have a different address. You have a different zip code. It's not 78230. It's heaven, the kingdom of God. We're not of the world. And because of that, the world will hate us. He says, just as I am not of the world. Verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Jesus, not of the world, came into the world with the truth. And because of this, the world hated him. Now we who have believed in him have been set apart from the world. Now filled with the word of God, we are filled with the truth. And the world will hate us as well. But Jesus says, I am not asking that we would be taken out of the world. Instead, he has now sent us back into the world the way that he was. That just as he came from heaven to earth with the light of the gospel of the truth, he has now sent us into the darkness with the light of the word of God, with the truth. And what will keep us? What will sanctify us? What will keep us from the power of the evil one as we engage the hurting, the broken, the lost, those who are bound, those who are in darkness? What will keep us from having strongholds set up in our lives is that we must know the word. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. In our world today, we live, in a, we live in a crazy time. In 2020, like never before, 24-7 media, 24-7 social media, 24-7 news cycles. It is constant words, 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 going out and going forth. And if they are not coming from this, they are not true. They are lies. 
I don't care what channel you tune into. If it is not from the word of God, if it is not from someone who is submitted in under the word of God, it is full of lies and deceit with the intention of putting a stronghold in your life from which the enemy can wreak havoc on you and attack you. We are being inundated with lies, inundated with deceit. Dark spiritual forces constantly working to undermine the truth of God's word in our lives. These forces want to shape and reshape the way you view the world so that you see life not as it is, but see life through the lens of a lie. And the end result of that lie in your life will be destruction. But you are called to be a person of the truth. You are called to be a person of God's word. You're called to be a person of the light. And so read the word, read the word. Turn off the news, turn off the TV, turn off the Facebook. Read the word, study the word, learn the word, understand the word, be a student of the word, live the word, pray the word, sing the word of God in your house, fill your house, fill your life, fill your car, fill your soul, fill your mind, fill your thoughts with the word of God and you will walk in freedom. Amen. What are we doing? What are we doing? There's a battle raging. It's very evident. But it is a battle not between political parties. It is a battle between truth and lies. And we as people who have the truth, who have believed the truth, we cannot be swept away with the culture. Our destiny is tied to something greater than the destiny of this culture. Our destiny is tied to something greater than the destiny of this nation. We must share the truth. We must share the word. We must combat the lies of the enemy, first in our own hearts, and then then in the lives of the people that we love. But we certainly can't do that if we don't know how to use this word, if we're not familiar with it, if, if we don't understand what God's word teaches. There's a fight. There's a battle. God has called us, all of us, to engage in this fight, in this battle. May we, by his grace, enlist in his army to bring freedom and liberty to those who are bound and in darkness. Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you for your word. It truly is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It truly is light shining in the darkness. And Lord, you have called us, your people, to be lights, to be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Lord, you've called us, your people, to be salt, to be a preservative agent in the world that is decaying. So Lord, help us, forgive us, sanctify us, set us free from the false and lead us into the truth. And Lord, that we would know and embrace your truth as we know and embrace your word and that we would be used by you to bring freedom and liberty to those who are bound. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.